Hello noble ones and welcome to Metatron's Academy. Today's video is a little bit of an unusual video, particularly when compared to the regular topics on this channel. And we're going to talk about what got me specifically into language learning and what began this whole journey through uh, multiple language fluency and the whole academic section of it and then becoming a teacher of languages. I hope that you can still find some educational value into me sharing my own personal experience. So when it comes to foreign language acquisition, for me, everything started not in my early childhood, but as a teenager, in the sense that as a very young child, I wasn't really exposed to language learning, which is one of the reasons why, personally, as a former school teacher, one of the things that I would do with my students would be to immediately try to spot if someone had a particular proclivity or a special interest or perhaps natural talent towards language learning in order for me as a school teacher to notify the parents immediately because the sooner you start the better. Still, for me, everything started as a teenager because Again, as a teenager, I moved to England. And my personal experience in the UK for two years as a teenager was really when I built the foundation for both my English, but in general, language studies. So as an Italian living in England, uh, one of the first things that I noticed is that picking up English wasn't particularly demanding or difficult for me. And even though, of course, my pronunciation is not perfect, there is always room for improvement. I recognize that. But I immediately recognized the fact that I think I had a good year and I believe I still have a good year. Now, because of that, as I was learning English, and I was in England, and at one point I was moved into a house where I was sharing my flat with a Frenchman, that's when I started to think, yeah, you know, maybe I could start learning a little bit of French, which is where I got my very basic foundation of French, um, because I tried to kind of practice a little bit with him. And so I thought to myself, you know, when I finish with my English and I go back to England and I feel like I've reached fluency in English, uh, I'd like to start learning French. Did I ever do that? Well, a little bit, but things changed as I started to begin my university journey. That's when I needed to decide, okay, I want to do languages. I'm back in Italy. What languages should I choose? And initially I was thinking I could major in English, then I could do maybe French, Spanish, but then it came to me. You see, when I was 14, I was always fascinated with Japanese and Japan. I liked the samurai, I liked Japanese martial arts, I used to do uh, karate. And, and when I was in England, at one point I spent some time together with a, uh, a homemate from Japan. And even though we communicated entirely in English and it's not like I learned any Japanese with him, but I did think to myself, hey, why don't you teach me one or two words? And then I thought, maybe Japanese could be a good idea. But then I kind of removed that thought because, you know, you, normally you think, yeah, you want to do French, you want to do Spanish, maybe Japanese was too hard. But then again, as I was trying to decide what university I should study in, that's when, you know, I heard from my cousin, Irene, and she had moved from Sicily, where we are originally from, to Naples, because in Italy, you have two cities, namely Naples and Venice, that focus on extreme Eastern languages, such as Chinese, meaning Mandarin usually. Uh, I don't think they have a Cantonese course. So Mandarin, Japanese, Korean, and lots of other languages like that. And she was studying Hindi because even though she's from Sicily like me, she was actually born in India. She was just, just happened to be born there. She, she's a full-on Italian, her parents are Italian, but she was always, you know, kind of connected. She always liked the idea of maybe I could learn Hindi. And so she started focusing her major was in Hindi. And that's when she told me, you know that they do Japanese here. And the moment I heard that, the split second I heard that, I immediately moved to Naples and I started majoring in Japanese. So during my first year, I was also taking English classes just because I'm like, you know, I'm already fluent in English. I might as well just add it to my degree. It'd be easy so that I could, you know, I didn't need to study much for that. And I could just go and take the tests and then I can divert the entirety and focus fire on my Japanese. So first year I studied Japanese really, really hard and then as I became a second year student I got my first scholarship and that's when they, you know, the university, the faculty uh, told us that as, as a second year students we were allowed, because we were majoring in languages, to choose a third language if we wanted to. And that's when I decided to start looking into Mandarin Chinese. And so for my second year at university I was trying to double my focus and I was attending both Japanese classes and Mandarin classes and that's when I really fell in love for Mandarin. Initially I chose it mostly because I was interested in the history since 
during my first year at university, I had studied all the different dynasties and the history of China together with the history of Japan. And I was fascinated by it. I'm like, wow, that's, just, that's great. But the, the thing that made me choose Mandarin as my minor was the challenge of it. The fact that it was a tonal language that was so difficult and that so many people said, oh yeah, no, it's impossible because of the tone. So unless you have a good year, you can't tackle it. And then I thought to myself, I think I do have a good year. And even when I'm trying to learn Japanese, my pitches weren't perfect. They're not perfect now. But, you know, my pronunciation was pretty good. My consonants, my vowels, I think I was doing well. So I decided I want to try. I just want to try. So during my first year, I really focused via on my Mandarin, trying also at the same time to keep my marks up when it came to my Japanese. And so at the end of my second year, I've got my second scholarship. And I used the money from that scholarship, which I believe back in the day was like maybe $1,500, which for me was a lot of money at the time. I used that money to buy a ticket to Japan. So here I am, end of a second year student career, flying to Japan, spending three months there. But why did I choose to do that? And why three months? Well, the first is pretty simple. I had already had the experience of moving to another country, the UK, to learn English, and it had worked wonderfully for me. So I thought I need to replicate that. I need to have the exact same experience, but with Japan. Now, given in England, when I was in England, I spent two years there in a row. Why did I not spend two years in Japan? Well, because you need a visa. Whereas in England, back in the day, it was, this is pre-Brexit, so an Italian could just go to England and stay there as long as he wanted. But uh, things were not like that for Japan. So when I moved to Japan, three months was the, the maximum amount allowed for a tourist. And of course you could maybe go to Korea, stay two weeks there, and then go back to Japan and sort of reset those three months limitation that you have as a tourist, but I didn't have enough money for that anyway. So I spent three months, I speak to the Japanese as much as possible, I frequent courses, attend courses, go to the library, study, like I would, I would do a study session every morning, select a few new grammar rules, and then I would try and practice those during the afternoon and the evening with both my friends, but also trying to meet new people, and perhaps even like going to the freaking supermarket or mini market, I would just try to speak to as many people as possible, and of course the fact that I am generally speaking an, an extroverted person, um, very outgoing, uh, obviously helped. So after that, I go back to Naples and I take my second year test, which I still had to take for Japanese, and I, I just nail it. And the, and the teacher and all, the, all my classmate, classmates, they're like, wow, we can tell that you know, your three months in Japan really helped, and they really did. So then my third year at university begins, and then also my fourth year, and during these years I mostly start focusing more on my Japanese, and I kind of leave Mandarin aside. I had passed the tests, so done really well and I kind of cut, move it to the side because now I needed to focus on finishing my Japanese studies. I still had two, more, two or three more exams to take and so I do that. I finish everything, I get my university degree and that's when my uncle Claudio, uh, as a sort of gift, graduation gift, he buys me another ticket to Japan. And here I am, so happy. I've just graduated, I'm gonna go spend another three months in Japan, and this time, uh, you know, I feel more confident with my Japanese, and I think I can build better relationships, perhaps even lasting relationships, friendships, and who knows, maybe I could even find a job. So, which was my dream, by the way, the idea of just living in Japan. So I fly, and I am uh, killing it. I'm having a great time, but then I, I run out of money. I didn't have any more money and uh, and by the way I had had a third scholarship but I had to use that one to pay for all my uh, university taxes and uh, and books and just to graduate so I had already spent most of that money and so I'm in Japan I have no money what do I do so I send an email to my professor who was Japanese uh, in Italy and I ask her do you have anyone my contacts that someone you, that you could tell me about that I could send my, my uh, CV or my resume uh, to see if I can you know maybe find a job so she does give me a contact with this company I contact them they respond back and they say yes come to our area which at the time I was in Tokyo I didn't specify I spent the majority of my time for the first three months and the second three months in Tokyo and Yokohama but this person was in Kansai near Osaka we're kind of closer to Kobe, actually. So I, I move 
I, I take a train, go to meet this person, have an interview. Uh, he was Japanese, my boss, and he was impressed with my Japanese. He was like, wow, this is really nice that you speak Japanese. I am going to hire you. So he, he makes me an offer. It was, uh, it was a decent offer. And, so, and by the way, it was my first real job. Like I had had other jobs like throughout my entire university career I worked like teaching private lessons I worked a little bit I did lots of different jobs I even worked at the department of like salary and stipends at university so I, I did some 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 jobs like that but this was a full-time job so I accept the job and what I do is kind of a double job on one side I was employed directly by the company as an interpreter and translator on the other side, because my boss also owned an Italian restaurant, and I, I'm Italian, he's like, maybe you could also work at this restaurant, for example, the weekends or during the week when we are busy as a waiter. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do whatever. So I work both as a translator, office job, and I work as a waiter. I'm working like a maniac at this time. But the reason why that was good for me is because all of my co-workers, all of my um, colleagues were Japanese. So I get to practice my Japanese, to use my Japanese on a daily basis, and now I live in Japan and I have a full-on work visa valid for three years. So I use the entirety of my visa and I spend my three years in Japan, I build fantastic relationships, meet wonderful people. Working in Japan is really tough. I had to work a lot. But luckily, we also had day offs and we also had the golden week, uh, which is like a period of 14 days. So you get free off work in summer in Japan. And, and also, as these three years finish um, and my visa was coming to an end, and my boss actually asked me, do you want to renew it? And I said, you know, no, because the only reason why I'm here is not because I wanted to do this as my life job, but because I wanted to learn Japanese. And honestly, after three and a half years already spent there, uh, I said, no, if possible, I told him, if you can just let me stay for another six months, which he vouched for, and there was no problem with immigration, just let me enjoy six months in Japan without having to work. I had, of course, saved some, some money as well. And then I'll just go back to Italy. I agreed to that. So I spent the following four, five months, probably just not working, but just enjoying Japan, taking karate lessons, taking kendo lessons, uh, playing video games, hanging out with Japanese. It was fantastic. As I w go back home to Italy, I then become a language teacher. And at first I was teaching English, and then my school starts to, decides to open a Japanese course, and they're like, you know what, you can double down and you can start teaching Japanese. So here is I am, after having spent a few years in Japan, after having spent a few years in England, I do I remember that at that time I was a little bit like, it's a shame that I never really reached fluency in Mandarin since I was progressing fast, but it's fine. Now I just need to focus on my English and my Japanese, and this is going to be my life's career. This is before becoming a YouTuber, mind you. I had no idea that this would have happened here, and also my main channel even more so, where we have now reached 800,000 subscribers. Regardless, here I am, I'm teaching, and I go on to teach for quite a few years and it's as a as I was a, a language teacher and I started working directly under the EU funds or through the EU funds of university and research I then sort of become also a professional examiner for working directly for the city and guilds of London and uh, so I start doing international tests like preparing students and then also students would come to me uh, so that they could take their international certifications in B1 from A1 to C2 I myself get my own C2 in English just to you know because I needed it uh, I thought I needed the experience in order to be able to prepare students more effectively. I needed to kind of go through it. And so I do that. And then at the same time, I decide, you know what? I want to start making videos on YouTube. And that's when I opened my first channel, my main channel, Metatron. Uh, this Metatron's Academy being the second channel that I've just recently opened in March. But Metatron, I opened about nine years ago. And I was still a, a full-time teacher. And I will continue to do both. Uh, make videos on YouTube and teach for another few years until my channel sort of explodes or grows to a point where I was actually making more money making videos than I was uh, teaching at school and that's when I uh, sort of resign and stop working at school as an educator and I start focusing on my channel. Then, uh, you know, of course, as the years go by, I meet my now wife at the time, my, my girlfriend, and then we get married, I move to America, and here I am. And so right now, about a year ago, I started again to decide to focus on Mandarin. And I did about six, seven months of full immersion, which really helped increasing my fluency in Mandarin. Then I got really busy lately, and I kind of stopped. 
But because now I have this channel, I think I'd like to start again, uh, focusing on my Mandarin and maybe focusing on all the other languages that I have an interest in. For example, classical Latin, which I did study at university, and of course, uh, modern Greek and the other languages that I haven't mentioned here because they are just marginal languages that don't really uh, represent the, the languages that I'm most uh, fluent in and that I feel more confident with. But you can find a link in the description below uh, to the, a video where I kind of show my, my level in the various languages that I've studied through this uh, linguistic journey. So here we are. Uh, right now my goal is of course to make sure I don't forget my Japanese. Uh, I do have a, a channel entirely in Japanese. You'll find that link in the description. I have so many channels. Uh, I don't really post very often, but occasionally I do, uh, just as a way to practice it. I want to reach fluency in Mandarin, which I never really fully did. Um, I'm confident enough to go to a Chinese and start talking, but I'm not uh, very fluent and very confident in whether uh, on how much I can understand them when they speak back to me. So I definitely need to improve my my ability, and perhaps one day I'd like to to really really start learning French rather than basing myself on what I can remember from many, many years ago. I need to really start working on that. So Mandarin and, and French will be the languages I want to reach fluency in, maintaining fluency in Japanese and, and always improve in English. And therefore, these are the four languages that I'm mostly interested in uh, right now uh, in my life. But what languages would you uh, like to study? What language experiences have you had? And have you ever spent uh, a significant amount of time, a period of time in another, in another country in order to uh, master their language. But of course, let me know and share your experiences in the comments below. As always, thank you so much for listening to me and for joining Metatronics Academy.